this time on the Highland Woodworker. And now's when I usually tell the folks, plug your ears because she's fixing to get loud. We take a step back in time and learn how folks on the frontier did their woodworking without modern machinery. Then period furniture maker Alf Sharp has an old take on making a rabbit appear. The striation effect of this, the grain, is manipulated by staggering uh, different pieces going up one side and then down the other. Michael Gilmartin takes us inside his studio and spills his secrets on his masterful furniture designs. All of this and more, this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love Highland Woodworking. It's where I buy my woodworking tools and get a good woodworking education. Ed Sin. Nice to see you, Chuck. Nice to see you. Uh, Ed, I am doing some edge clamping of some big panels, and uh, I really don't have all the clamps I need and would like to keep some pressure in the middle. I hear there's something new. There is a clamp called a bow clamp, and I'll show you in our clamp room. I think it'll be just what you need. Well, I'll tell you what, before I forget, do you like 18th century tools? Oh, old tools are very cool. Well, Bill Maddox is going to show us how he uses them every day. I look forward to seeing that. Well, let's go see now. Bill Maddox at Chuck. Manster Station. Good to see you, Chuck. Glad you made it in. Oh, it's nice. I'm used to being met at the door with an axe, so, you know, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> good, good. Well, I've, I've got her sheathed up, so she'll be safe here for a while. Oh. Come here, let me make you a part of our history out here and let you fit in a little closer with what we're doing. What a wonderful place. But, you know, Bill, it's too cold for this garb. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> we're in the mid-30s. It's spitting snow out here. Uh, here's Can't you a good uh, period wool coat, that ought to work you up a number there. Well, I, I feel nice like I'm, I fit in a little better now. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Now, what are you doing here, Bill? Well, what I'm doing is I'm actually cutting out the relief spots uh, on this log, basically making the glutes, so to speak. And what I will be doing here in a moment is I will be standing this log, rolling it up on end. I will dog it back down. And upon doing that, I will take an ax and start knocking out these large sections here to help bring the wood down to one level. And what it'll do is it'll look very similar to this bench that I've got it set on here. This is the uh, precursor of another one of our benches. Well, Bill, it looks like that you're about a 18th century a frontier woodworker. Is that the idea? That is the idea. Our premise here at Mansker Station is to provide an insight as to what life was like at these forted stations out here on the Cumberland frontier. We know that James Robertson, founder of Nashville, and Casper Mansker both arrived out here at approximately the same time. And in doing that, even though they had made several journeys out here beforehand, just hunting the area, when they came back to establish these stations or a place of safety for these settlers coming out, they're, as you can see, the, using a primary building source or primary building material of the trees, sure. the forests out here. Well, let's see you in action here. I can't wait to see how this is done. As you can see, if I hadn't had those relief cuts cut up in here, I think I'd still be back here struggling with it. Well, you know, it, it reminds me of when uh, I'm using a bandsaw and I make relief cuts on the inside of a radius that might be a, a, little, a little too tight for the particular blade. Yeah, exactly. And that way you're cutting smaller pieces and you can you the know, break same it down. exact yeah. premise, the same exact premise. Yeah. yeah. Now what I want to do is what they call hue to the line. Mm -hmm. Now, just prior, I had come in 
and just lightly marked out something through here. Yeah. But a lot of times when I'm hewing, I'm hewing more so by eye. Yeah. So I'll sit here and judge my thickness of what I need to get it mm -hmm. down to, and now I'll actually come back. Use with, a hewing axe? Exactly. A good old American side axe right here. This here is something that was manufactured or actually added on to after 1740. So this axe right here in itself probably dates to about 1790. And you can actually see some of the old blacksmith forge marks in here. Sure. Where the piece of tool steel was forged into it. Well, Bill, is it bent or is it... No, the it looks handle, like it's at a that's right. angle a little bit. What we have right here, the handle has some cast off on it. This is going to put exactly. you off to the side so that you can exactly. actually... Exactly. As you can yeah. see right here, your hands are now free and clear. Sure. And you're able to hew this in just a gentle application. And here's where I usually tend to tell folks, okay, if we're going to do this, what Look you need that. to start doing is go ahead and reference your feet apart. Mm -hmm. And you need to just drop her in on that line and keep going. From here, uh, you could cross cut a piece. Yes, sir. And then take it into your shop. Take it into my shop and start any other uh, building process that I need out here. Right now, here I bet shop. you're not going to take it in there to the table saw or the band saw. No, unfortunately, I don't have one of those out well, here. Let's see what you got. All right, come on in. All right. Come on in. Well, Bill, so this is your lathe, and I see uh, some of the major parts of the lathes that we use today. Commonly There's... used today, very, very much so. And uh, as, as we see, um, we have headstocks or puppets sure. uh, on this lathe, just as we mm -hmm. have on modern lathes today. A tool uh, rest. Tool rest, exactly. And uh, I love the fact that when uh, Brian designed this one, he made it to where I could move it in and out and around uh, sure. pretty much well. Um, <clears throat> I mean, works wonderfully. This uh, particular lathe is a uh, uh, derivative of an early French lathe. It is a spring pole lathe. This one actually has a small four and a half foot hickory spring down here on the side. And what I love about this one, whereas most spring pole lathes that I encounter are uh, very high speed, this particular lathe is very high torque. Oh. So it might take a little more oomph, so to speak, to get her to turn. Mm -hmm. But boy, once she starts turning. Is that right? Woo! <laughs> I mean, she is ready to cut. This, and you'll notice, I'm coming up on this side of the stock because as I push down, I'm going to want this stock to turn towards me. Mm -hmm. And what I'll do is I'll do a couple of turns here on this far end, which will go ahead and give me more of a smooth surface, and then I'll swap everything around, and I'll actually be able to achieve the speeds that I need to do my turning. All right, and now is when I usually tell the folks, plug your ears, because she's fixing to get loud. How fast it works. <laughs> the sound's not so bad. <laughs> no, it's not, not as bad. So, Bill, a bench like this is, or a larger one is going to be uh, what you're working on there. Yes, sir. Very, very much so, uh, Chuck. And uh, the thing is, is as we need these benches, I, I go ahead and turn them out. Uh, out here in between the cabins right now, I believe I have seven uh, blackjack oak logs already hewn. They're just little short pieces like this. Sure. Just waiting for the day that uh, somebody goes, Bill, we need another bench. And then I break out the riving and the shaving horse and the draw knives, make legs for them. Well, you have broken out the them tools <laughs> for us here. You have got a great... Uh, collection. Mm -hmm. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I exactly. Very, very much so. It's, uh, it's, it has become a passion uh, with me to be able to preserve these wonderful pieces of history right here. Uh, a few of them, you know, have been uh, reconstructs of myself, but a lot of them have been originals that uh, folks have had uh, that have known my love of tools. A uh, wonderful handmade angle gauge here. What we're looking at here is late 18th century, early 19th century, and this is where I tend to find a lot of the tools in 
grandpa's and great grandpa's collection. That's where these tools tend to come from. Great little marking gauge. This is an early wedge type marking gauge. When I build uh, furniture at my shop in the Hermitage, or whether I'm building out here, we'll scribe a line right alongside the best of them. Those big timber slicks come in really great when you're looking to get that final fit on that dovetail. You can slide that up in there and they, they do wonders uh, for marking uh, the timber race knife right there. Uh, you'll actually see that has a little fold-out drag blade or a fold-out drag, drag knife with it uh, that works works wonders. The people that come to Mansker Station here, usually on a daily basis, Monday through Friday, uh, get to see me in some aspect of using these out here. So whether I'm manufacturing parts for a fence for our gardens, a repair on a cabin, a new mantle, a window frame and shutter, anything that I need to manufacture, all I have to do is get a hold of the wood if it's preferably not frozen. Sure, <laughs> and this is just 10 miles north of, of Nashville, Nashville uh, Goodlettsville, Goodlettsville, Tennessee, Tennessee. Mansker Station. You can come here and really feel and see what the 18th century woodworker on the frontier was like. Very much thank so. Thank you so much, Chuck, thank Bill. you for coming out. I've enjoyed having you all out here today. And uh, tell you what, why don't you hang on to that coat for your trip back? Oh, you might, I'm going to need might have to might have to need that to stay warm. Well, with. thank you. You're going to have to fight me for it anyway. <laughs> yeah, the bow clamp, clamping calls, they're sold in pairs, and it has a CNC machined camber on one edge, and that curved part allows you to put it down on your material, and then a clamp at each end is going to put pressure all the way across and including right to the middle, so you can get good clamping pressure just with two clamps. That's a great idea. The little cutout here on the end, you can put an F-style clamp in it if you want to slip it right on in the end or you can just have your clamp go right on top. It saves on bar clamps too. Yep. Yeah. It's really quite a savings. You can use it for veneer glue ups to uh, put on a platen to get point pressure right in the middle of a big square glue up so it avoids you having to have a big deep reach clamp which is heavy and pretty expensive as well. Yes, I want to try the bow clamp. I think it'll do a great job in my shop. Yeah, take them back and let us know how they work out. I will. Coming up, our friend Alf Sharp has a groovy rabbit technique that will have you hopping to your workshop to try it out. In exploring the plywood material, I started out using Baltic birch. Hear why master furniture designer Michael Gilmartin switched to a different building material to perfect his artistic pieces. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of one to 10, I'm probably about a five. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more, plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. Order a saw stop professional cabinet saw from Highland Woodworking in March or April of 2015 and choose either one of these accessories for free. That's a $199 extra value. Do you need wood? Then go nowhere but Bell Forest Products. Come stand in awe of our 20,000 square foot showroom that houses over 75 species of exotic wood, the largest in the Midwest. What more could you want? A knowledgeable staff? Well, come in and speak to one of these handsome young men because they know wood. They breathe wood. They eat wood. They live wood. They love wood. They are wood. So plan your adventure to Bell Forest Products, 200 East Hematite Street, downtown Ishpeming, or visit us online at bellforestproducts.com. Because we got wood. Forest, manufacturer of the award-winning Woodworker II, presents the PVW blade, designed specifically for the rip and cross-cutting of plywood and plywood veneers without splintering or chip-outs. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for over 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand-cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, 
and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, go to highlandwoodworking.com. Master woodworker Alf Sharp helps us tame a tough rabbit, this time on Popular Woodworking Magazine's Tips, Tricks, and Techniques. Alf Sharp, you've got a beautiful Newport tea table uh, here that you're working on, and uh, this exquisite top that I think you said you did it with routers and jigs and so forth. We, we cut all the moldings with router jigs. Uh, excavated the top. You can even see where I haven't finished cleaning it out. Wow, uh, it's it's gonna be a beauty. And then uh, this uh, serpentine apron is just gorgeous. But I tell you what, the carving on these legs and the ball and claw, uh, which I think you're piercing, is right. just really uh, marvelous. You were telling me that there's a place here where you could make a rabbit and you could do it by hand, and uh, that it would actually be somewhat easier to do it the way the old guys would do it. That's right. I'll show you where the rabbit will go here. Uh, when, when, this, when the table's all finished, there'll be a little molding that goes around beneath the top, right on top of the rail, like this. It'll go all the way around. And uh, it'll be attached permanently to the rail and the legs, like this. So. That leaves this little notch behind the molding. And so what we'll do is, um, with the top, once, once it's finished, we'll cut a rabbit in the top that, uh, that makes a little, a little plug on the inside here that, that notches down inside that molding here. Uh, and and that, that will just provide a little extra um, uh, support and control of the top. The top is, is, is attached so that it can't be lifted off, but it's allowed to float. So it's nice to have a little plug sitting down in there to, uh, uh, to keep it in place. So it'll be kind of a raised <clears throat> field here. That's right. Uh, That's right. Rabbit. And, <clears throat> uh, of course, when this table was originally made, there were no power tools to speak of. So so uh, whenever a craftsman wanted to create a rabbit like that, he would rely on a rabbit plane. And actually, he could do the work very quickly uh, with a really neat little technique that I, I'd like to show you if you'd like to see how that happens. Let's see it. OK, Chuck. So uh, this is the only tool that we're going to need for this process. I'm not even going to use a fence to locate the, the tool. This is, a, uh, this is an original type of rabbit plane that would have been used by a maker in the uh, 18th century. Uh, it's a wonderful plane and I like to use it often. I'm not gonna use it this time, but uh, the process is the same. So first, we're gonna take the board that we're gonna rabbit and we'll just, we'll create, we'll define the extents of the rabbit with uh, a marking gauge. Uh, here, I'll just, they're just gonna be arbitrary. Uh, so there's the depth of the rabbit. Okay. And then, here will be the width of the rabbit. Of course, if you have a, a particular project you're working on, those you'll you'll set up to those dimensions. Uh, <clears throat> so that's marked out. I'll just now put it in the bench. <clears throat> and I'll take my modern rabbit plane, and you'll notice I'm going to start here. But I'm not going to I'm not going to get up too close to the line that I created. I'm just going to. Make a track with the plane. Okay, there I'm probably one or two strokes away from that depth. <clears throat> now I'm just going to turn the plane over, set it in the cut that I've already made, and like this. 
I'm gonna work to my width line. Okay, so now I'm to my final line. I'm just gonna come back once again, using that as a fence. Take one more cut here, maybe, maybe another one back here at the back end. There you go. And there we have our nice clean square rabbit using no fence, nothing but the, the, the rabbit plane. And you got to your uh, depth line and you got to your width in. Yes. That is just a great job. I can't wait to get back to my shop and try that. Well, thank you, Chuck. Isn't that a sweet trick? You betcha. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And I came up with this design very quickly. You won't believe what inspired this amazing rocker. Find out when we come back. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Rikon Power Tools, a leader in woodworking power tools for over 10 years with a passion for quality and performance at an affordable price. Rikon has a full line of dependable tools, including a long list of industry-leading bandsaws like their new powerful 10, 350, 14-inch professional. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Making wood surfboards is something that goes back hundreds of years. I think what I love about making surfboards out of wood is that they are really, really beautiful. Each and every board is completely different, individualized. The advantage that we have now in making Hollywood surfboards is that we have very advanced woodworking tools. I'm Patrick Burnett. I make wood surfboards in Komiki, Cape Town. Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation. Introducing the ultimate flush trim rounder bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. Craig, from the first cut to the final assembly, providing woodworkers with products that help simplify woodworking challenges. Craig. If you can't make it to Atlanta, then you can always shop us on the web at www.highlandwoodworking.com. Moment with the Master is presented by Triton Precision Power Tools. Patrons of the arts have found that Michael Gilmartin's unique woodwork stacks up with the best. Let's spend a moment with this extraordinary master. I was always partial to wood as far as manipulating different ideas with scraps and things like that. I also saw what people were doing. and That really got me inspired. What, that people were doing very, very provocative ideas in, in sculptural form. And uh, I figured that, that's a path I want to follow. For almost three decades, furniture maker Michael Gilmartin has not only followed that path, but blazed new trails in furniture design. His world-famous Gilmartin Rocker has been featured in national publications and even inside a psychology textbook. His imaginative, robust rocker is on permanent display at the Brooklyn Museum in New York City, while other impeccable pieces turn heads at many U.S. museums as well, including the exclusive High Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. I was a kid from Long Island, and my girlfriend lived upstate New York, and our father rebuilt and renovated clocks. I started doing stuff with my hands to him to get her attention. All right, oh, I could make that. She would tell me how to make, you know, make, I mean, she knew more about woodworking than I did, watching a dad and a brother. So, it, and that was funny, but I, I, you know, I was making all these god awful things, giving them a title and selling them, you know, street festival, you know. And little by little, I started cleaning up my act and, and, and taking it a little bit more seriously. I was lucky to have other woodworking friends who said, look, if you, you got to clean up your act here, you know. You're, you're, you're still halfway there, pal. 
So I, what I did is I, um, I got a scholarship to go to Penland School of Crafts. And back then, I wrote like a three-sentence application. Like, and I said, imagine my play trying to sell this stuff in the South. And they bought it. This guy has a sense of humor. It's funny how life turns out sometimes. In the late 70s, he left the great North for some Southern exposure. The move to Atlanta was, was really a pragmatic business decision. Uh, Atlanta was growing. The, the amount of housing starts here uh, made it, made it uh, a very simple choice. Well, moving to Atlanta may have been a simple choice. Perfecting the Gil Martin rocker, however, was a bit more complicated. In exploring the plywood material, I started out using Baltic birch, uh, using a half-inch ply, solid Baltic birch, and it's a very heavy material. A hardwood and it's a lot more susceptible to, to movement, temperature and humidity changes in air conditioning than the Douglas fir marine plywood or the Luan, the, the uh, blonde mahogany plywood, which, which are softer woods, so allow for uh, a, a more a, a tolerance for expansion and contraction. The more stable woods to use. And I came up with this design very quickly. Uh, my, I was renovating my house and my plumber was on all fours with his head under the sink there. And I s took this posture and drew this curve, drew the outline of this piece on a piece of sheetrock uh, 10 feet away. And I knew that was it. This is, this is going to be a fabulous sculpted rocking chair. you got to be kidding. I can body, see yeah. this is his arms. Right. And this he was looking big, under big your sink. V body back, yes. And that's the, the back. The, ta the taper, yeah. It's marine fir plywood, and the striation effect of this, the grain, is manipulated by staggering uh, different pieces going up one side and then down the other, which creates this cadence, this... this Kind of the, the striations in the plywood are like, it's like a rhythm. Absolutely. Coming down the it, side here. Well you put. You call that cadence. Yes, well put rhythm. It's, that's wonderful. Well, that's just just amazing. So in some places it's stacked horizontally, some places it's stacked Vert vertically, yes. and then at the the joints it's got uh, uh, black walnut as an accent piece, which picks up on the the black dye in the plywood. And the uh, the seat itself is it feels like it's scooped out very gently. It's, it's slightly scooped and uh, for, for comfortable. And the front, the, the, what's critical is, is the splay in the front there. So you can move your body around, shift your weight, and still feel support, but be comfortable. One of the critical elements is the shape of this backrest as it comes down to the front. What it does, it takes the weight off your shoulders, reducing the stress off the spinal column and also allows you to be able to move your weight around in the chair. Well, I'd like to see kind of how you stack uh, the plywood in order to make, uh, to make a form. Sure. Uh, have you got something you can show us? I have a table that would show a great example of how, how this starts. So this is the cadence you were talking about, the, the way you stack your, your plywood. Absolutely. The, the plywood stacking is manipulated, uh, stacking down one side and then up the other, such that when it's carved, what you see is the striation effect of the grain. Well, that's amazing. The, the patterning. And it's close enough that uh, you don't have to remove that much material. Right, correct. Yeah. You keep the cadence the same, i.e. like an inch and a half or two, two inches gap between each one. Uh, it, you know, uh, first thought is that maybe you carved this out of one whole piece. Absolutely. Most people think that I start with a block. Uh, I don't. I, it's, it's only one piece that goes top to bottom and, and then you, everything else is added on. And so you, you just glue it all up yes. using uh, uh, various woodworking glues. Correct. And, and, and stick as many clamps on it as I can fit. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got a process of, of grinding away what's not wanted. Um, can you show that to me? Sure. This, this is a four inch grinder with a chainsaw wheel on it. And uh, it supplants using a chainsaw these days. Uh, it's very versatile and I can use it 
to create grooves, uh, to knock uh, hard edges off, and, and gently round, round over shapes. Very versatile tool. And with a handle here, it's just so safe. And it, it doesn't make uh, dust, does it? It throws chips. So that's, yes, it doesn't make dust, it throws chips. And so chips. you got plenty of time later to make dust. And so I bet uh, you make a lot of dust for this It sure one. does, uh, ubiquitous. Uh, that, that piece has a 100 grit disc on there and that's used to smooth after the uh, chainsaw grinder and get that shape uh, somewhat palatable. Then I follow up with detail work with this air tool here. We can finesse uh, different types of uh, pockets, uh, grooves, um, uh, areas that need to be um, gently um, surfaced. And so the, the edges here will flex just yes, enough. Yes, right. Uh, just, just enough play to allow to, to work the contours of the shapes. Yeah, and of course the biggest thing is usually knowing your tool, spending some time with it to know uh, when you can finesse with it and when you can... Absolutely. Well put. Even though a plumber might have inspired the Gil Martin Rocker, most of his inspirations come from masters in his artistic field. What I found so inspirational was uh, uh, this gallery in New York City, Peter Joseph Gallery. He would have uh, Wendell Castle in his stable. And any time there was a show that, uh, of Wendell's work, I, I would make sure I was there at the opening to, to get to chat with him again. And having Wendell in his stable, he had no problem getting other top artists around the country to, to show their work there. So he, he built a very, very good reputation. It was very inspirational to go to. Michael's keen observational eye and conversation starting furniture designs always keep this untraditional trailblazer one step ahead. I would like my legacy to be somebody who made lively, comfortable, and interesting furniture. Somebody who took the vernacular of furniture and really exploited the sculptural aspects of it. Well, the first time I saw bow clamps, I thought, well, I can make those. Those are just two wooden pieces. And what's this big bow in there? I guess that makes it a, a bow clamp. And how is that bow going to help me? Well, first of all, It'd be hard to make these because these are milled with using CNC machinery and to get that perfect arc, perfect arcs really can't be made that easily in the shop. You're going to have flats, you're going to have spaces and the idea is to have this point here is the major pressure point when you're using it uh, clamping up something and as you clamp from the ends you're going to be increasing pressure all the way across uh, this member. Well it looks like the bow clamp calls did a great job. I was able to do this with uh, two bar clamps and I've got a great glue joint here uh, that uh, is nice and even. It's all pulled up. <laughs> it looks like I've got continuous pressure on both sides from the calls. Uh, now, I want to add a nice piece of edge banding, uh, some curly maple edge banding to the front of this. This is going to end up being a, a decorative shelf. Did a great job of pulling up this, this uh, nice little piece of edge banding here. And the same thing might be used for uh, attaching a face plate to, to a cabinet uh, frame. Um, it looks like the, the bow clamp has done a great job with these two projects. And if you look at their website, uh, you'll see that there are many uses for it. I think it's a good addition to any good workshop. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today.
Well, that's all the time we have left for this episode. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. Thank you.